<laughs> Look with me in John chapter 12. Let's talk about wasted. How to delight Jesus and draw Judas. Uh, John chapter 12, reading in verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus raised from the dead. <clears throat> Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pound of pure nard, a very expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his, hair with, wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there, and <clears throat> not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead, they came. So the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing on him. <clears throat> Let's pray and just ask the Lord to bless his word this morning. <clears throat> Father, we just thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for your presence with us and the people you love so much. Father, I pray that we would encounter you through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen? amen. You have to forgive me this morning. <clears throat> My son came home with a, a sore throat about a week ago. And uh, we taught our kids to share, and uh, he shared. He shared with Denise, and Denise shared with me, and we shared with the girls, and all five of us have been through it. So uh, please forgive me uh, and bear with me this morning. <clears throat> During this season of Lent, we're walking with Jesus through the consecutive days of the Passion Week. Jesus' life was the most important life ever lived, and the Passion Week was the most important week of his life. There is more written in the Gospels about the Passion Week than any other week in Christ's life. Throughout the Passion Week, Jesus is our ultimate example. The way that Jesus spent Passion Week shows us how we ought to spend every week. Jesus shows us what we should prioritize. He shows us what we should focus our energies on and what to leave in the hands of God. Pastor Nick started us out with Palm Sunday. On Palm Sunday, Jesus spent the day determined to finish God's mission for his life. And we need to walk with that same determination. <coughs> Excuse me. On Holy Monday, Jesus spent the day investing in God's house. On Holy Tuesday, Jesus spent the day contending for lost souls. You know, Holy Tuesday is considered the longest day of Jesus' life. There's more scripture written about Holy Tuesday than any other single day of Jesus' life. And it's a beautiful picture that we have of Jesus. The way he spent the longest day of his life was contending for the hearts of those who would hand him over to be crucified. You know, we read in the book of Acts that many of them later on came to believe on Jesus because he contended for their hearts that day. <clears throat> Today I want to talk with you about Holy Wednesday. Holy Wednesday is called the silent day. On Tuesday night, Jesus went back to Bethany, and he spent the night in the suburb of Bethany, about a, a mile outside of Jerusalem. And Jesus spent all day there on Wednesday, but the Bible doesn't say what he was doing during the day. I believe that he was just privately enjoying the company of his friends and his loved ones. On Wednesday evening... A dinner party was thrown in Jesus' honor. And during that party, Mary lavished a bottle of precious perfume on Jesus. Her extravagant act of worship pushed Judas over the edge. He left that dinner party early and he walked to Jerusalem in the dark to arrange Jesus' betrayal. So on Holy Wednesday, we have one of the most beautiful acts in the entire Bible, followed by one of the most ugly acts in the entire Bible. And I want to talk about that with you this morning. 
My very first job in high school was a stock boy at an auto parts store. And I remember one slow night, there were a couple of cashiers talking at the front of the store, and they had just come back from a ski trip, and they were reminiscing about the weekend, and they said, oh yeah, we were so wasted. And then they started talking about this party and and that trip into the city, and, and every memory ended with the refrain, oh, we were so wasted. Finally, I said to them, it sounds to me as, as if you can't have a good time unless you're wasted. They looked at me as if I had two heads. They said, that's the whole point, isn't it? To get wasted. At the time, I had to tell you I didn't agree with them, but I've actually come to the conclusion they were right. The whole point of life really is to get wasted. Oh, not in the sense of being high or being inebriated, but in the sense of being drunk in love with Jesus. Mary of Bethany was wasted in the sense of Song of Solomon. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. We rejoice and we delight in you. We praise your love more than wine. Just, just look at Mary in this story. She has absolutely no sense of self-consciousness. She has no inhibitions. She's unreserved, expressing her passion for Jesus. She's oblivious to propriety. She was reckless. At a dinner party given in Jesus' honor, she rushed in and she broke the seal on a jar of extremely expensive, overpowering perfume. And she poured a whole pound of thick ointment on Jesus' head. Imagine it to be something like the consistency of shampoo or or hand lotion uh, with an overwhelmingly sweet fragrance. It matted in Jesus' hair and in his beard. It drenched his robe. It soaked his skin all the way to his feet. And then Mary did the unthinkable. She let down her hair in public and she dried Jesus' feet with her hair. Mary was wasted. She was drunk in love, not not in an an earthly romantic way, but in a holy way. She forgot herself and everything else. And Jesus affirms that that's pretty much the point of life, to get wasted. The point of life is to become so drunk in love with him that you can't refrain from expressing it no matter who is watching you. The point is to love him unreservedly. The point is to love him extravagantly, lavishly, generously, sacrificially, all the way past the point of no return. The Gospels contain three snapshots of Mary. In each snapshot, she is portrayed as a model disciple. Every time we see Mary, she's at the feet of Jesus. A rabbi's disciples sat at his feet to learn. So each time we see Mary in the Bible, she is in the position and in the posture of a disciple. At this dinner, Mary did everything right that the disciples would do wrong the next night at the Last Supper. When Jesus spoke of his death to the disciples, they refused to believe him. They refused to accept it, but Mary had been listening closely to Jesus. She knew what he intended to do in Jerusalem, so she came to lavish this gift on Jesus that became an unwitting prophetic act for his burial. The disciples failed to wash Jesus' feet in the upper room on Thursday night, so Jesus washed their feet and he nudged them to follow his his example, but Mary washed Jesus' feet intuitively. She she washed his feet without being prodded by him. Mary was way ahead, and the twelve were lagging far behind. So if Mary is a model disciple, how can we become like her? First of all, how can we get wasted like Mary? Well, I I see how in, in the three snapshots of her life. How do we get wasted like Mary? First of all, we get wasted by spending time in his presence. There are many people who spent time in close proximity to Jesus, but not all of them spent time in his presence. Many people uh, attended the first dinner at Mary and Martha's house. That's the dinner where Martha lost her cool, if you remember. But, But only Mary sat at Jesus' feet. 
And it's still true today. There are many people who, who have come in close proximity with Jesus, but they haven't yet really experienced the beauty of being in his presence. You see, to be in his presence is to become keenly aware that Jesus is with you. His presence causes your heart to overflow with joy. His presence causes your emotions to be at peace. His presence causes your thoughts to be optimistic and confident. His presence causes your spirit to be light and carefree. The Bible compares the effects of his presence with the effects of wine. The Hebrew word for glory means weight. On the night that I received the beautiful baptism of the Holy Spirit, I was eight years old, I was lying in my bed, and the presence of God came down in my room, and it pushed down on me like a heavy, warm blanket. I was eight years old then, and I'm 51 now, and I want to tell you that every moment of my life, from that night to this very morning, this moment, I have known that Jesus is with me. To be in his presence means that your attention is keenly focused on Jesus. It means you fasten your thoughts on him in a way that you stop worrying about everything else for a little bit. It means to fasten the eyes of your heart on him so that you lose your appetite for everything else for a little while. It means to, to fix your spiritual ears on him so that you hear his whispers inside of you. While Martha huffed and puffed, Mary was only vaguely aware of her surroundings. She was captivated by Jesus. It's like sitting at a cafe with the one you love. And you know that there are people all around you, but, but they become what the photographers call bokeh. They, be, they become just a blurry background. Mary sat at Jesus' feet, and in his presence, she found peace. In his presence, she found affirmation. She found appreciation, value, worth. In his presence, Mary found security. She found a defender from her sister's harsh criticisms. She found someone who understood her quiet, introverted, introverted nature and who loved her for it. In his presence, Mary found freedom from stress and anxiety. Martha was worried about many things, but Mary wasn't. She was free from the expectations of others. She was free from the pressure to perform. In his presence, Mary found soul satisfaction. No wonder Mary was wasted she was drunk in love. And we can find the same things in the presence of Jesus. You know, we can be in his presence anytime, anywhere. We can be in his presence in a worship service like this one. We can be in his presence praying at home. We can be in his presence worshiping in the car or, or doing devotions during our lunch break. I've been in his presence planting bulbs in my garden, walking my dog, washing my car. How can we get wasted like Mary? By being in his presence. And another way is by hearing Jesus' beautiful heart in his words. There were many people who heard Jesus' words, but they didn't really hear Jesus' heart. They heard his words through the filter of their own appetites. They, they heard his words through the, the filter of their own ambitions. The twelve were like that. Peter didn't want to hear anything from Jesus about the cross. And Jesus said to Peter, he said, Peter, you savor the things of men, not the things of God. Even at the Last Supper, the disciples were bickering. They were questioning Jesus about their rewards and about positions of honor. Even John the Baptist sent an inquiry, Jesus, if you're the one, why haven't you set me free from this prison? But, but Mary listened more carefully than most. And in Jesus' words, she discerned the beauty of his heart. I am the beautiful shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down. The Father has given me authority to lay it down and to take it back again. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will ever snatch them out of my hand. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, will never be thirsty. Whoever comes to me, I love this, I will never drive away. 
the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. Their high officials abused their authority. But the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Take my yoke, learn from me, for I am humble and gentle in heart. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but he shall have the light of life. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me shall live even though he dies and whoever lives by believing in me shall never die. You know what Jesus tells us with those very last words? That when believers transition from this life to the next, we are never without his presence, not for a millisecond. During that blink of an eye when we leave this life and enter eternal life we don't die but we are alive in Jesus the entire time Mary listened closely and she discovered in Jesus a loving leader worth following she listened closely and she discovered a faithful savior worth trusting. She listened closely and she discovered a God with a compassionate, humble heart worth loving. She listened closely to Jesus and she heard a reason to cling to hope in life. She found a purpose in life. She heard wisdom for living. She found faith for eternal life. She listened closely and she discovered in Jesus a heart more beautiful, more pure, more noble, more selfless, more loving, more caring, more faithful, more consistent, more good than any heart she had ever known before. Mary was captivated by Jesus. She was intoxicated by his beautiful heart. Beloved, listen, read his words. Pray over his words. Listen, before you open your Bible, pray and ask. The Holy Spirit is the author. So it's the, one of the few books you can read where the author is right next to you. And you can just ask him when you don't understand something. Tell me, what did you mean by that? Pray and ask him, read his word, study his word, meditate on his word, and you'll discover Jesus' beautiful heart, and you will become wasted too. How can we get wasted like Mary? Be in his presence. Hear his beautiful heart in his words. And another way, be comforted and helped by Jesus in times of crisis. Mary loved Jesus because he comforted her in her time of need. In her grief, when Lazarus died, Jesus came calling for her. Jesus wept with her. He, he reassured her with his promises. He filled her with hope. Mary loved Jesus because he answered her prayers. She loved Jesus because he fixed what was unfixable. He cured what was uncurable. He restored what was lost beyond recovery. And Jesus does the same for us. Be in his presence. Discover his beautiful heart. Receive his comfort in times of need. And you will become wasted like Mary. You'll become wasted in the sense of Song of Solomon. My beloved is radiant and ruddy. Outstanding among 10,000. His mouth is sweetness itself. He is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend, Jesus. If Mary is a model disciple... How do we become like her? How can we pour out our love for Jesus? The scene in Bethany is not one that we can duplicate literally. Jesus has ascended to heaven. He's taken his seat at the right hand of the majesty. We can't physically pour perfume on Jesus' head or his feet. But there are some things that we can offer to Jesus. Beloved, listen, each one of us has our own portion of of perfume and it's extremely valuable it's extremely precious it's extremely rare once our perfume is spent it can't be recouped again but we don't offer it in one dramatic moment like mary did we offer it day by day by day by day how do we pour out our love for jesus like mary one way is by offering him the perfume of our service Mary wasn't the only one wasted at the dinner in Bethany. Martha was pretty wasted too. The perfume she offered Jesus was her perspiration, her service. After the embarrassing scene at the first dinner party where Martha lost her cool, Martha didn't stop serving. She just got a new attitude. 
When Jesus told her, Mary has chosen what is better, he wasn't saying that serving is a bad thing. It wasn't Martha's service, but it was her attitude that was the problem. Martha learned that service can be true worship if it's done with the right attitude. And it's true for us too. Our service can be precious perfume lavished on Jesus when it's done when our heart is in the right place. When Mary broke that seal on the perfume jar, the precious contents poured out irrevocably. She couldn't get it back again. And that's just like the precious hours that we spend serving Jesus and serving others for his sake. Beloved, listen, the hours that you've spent preparing for and teaching Sunday school, that's perfume you can't get back. The hours you've spent making food for someone who's sick or or making food for a church event or or to entertain people in your home for Jesus' sake, that's perfume you can't get back. The hours you've spent listening to people, counseling them, praying with them, encouraging them, that's, that's perfume you can't get back. The days that that you've given to missions, helping to prepare for missions trips, the vacation time, the dollars you you spent for missions, that's perfume you can't get back. Board meetings, building committee meetings, leaders meetings, teachers meetings, volunteer meetings, committee meetings, it's perfume you can't get back. What's your perfume? It's your days. It's your precious hours. It's the golden minutes of your life. It's your time. It's your efforts. It's your talents offered to Jesus. Your perfume is your perspiration for the sake of Jesus and his gospel. How can we pour out love for Jesus like Mary? By offering him the perfume of our pure adoration. Mary lavished pure worship on Jesus. Her thoughts were focused on him. Her heart was focused on him. She lavished love and honor on him. She lavished gratitude on him. And the beauty of it all delighted Jesus' heart all the way to the cross. Everybody look at me. I never realized all the times that I preached from this passage that the timing of the story. Just 36 hours before Jesus went to the cross, Mary made this offering of perfume. Now, I want you to think about it with me. Given the quality and the quantity and the consistency and the potency of that perfume, that beautiful scent stayed with Jesus all the way to the cross. Just a dab of of that powerful perfume behind her ear would have been enough for, for a night out. Ever have a friend who overdoes it a little with the cologne or the perfume? Had a young guy come visit me in my office a while back ago, and he took a bath in Drakkar Noir before he came to see me. That smell was in my office for a week. It was on my sofa. I opened my windows, my French door. I couldn't, couldn't get it out. The huge quantity and the potency of Mary's perfume filled the entire house with the fragrance and that thick lotion it matted in Jesus hair and his beard it soaked onto his robes so when Jesus perspired in the garden in prayer the next night that scent was reactivated When he was lashed 39 times and then they put his own robe back on him again, that scent was reactivated. When the blood ran from his brow into his hair and his beard, the the scent was reactivated all the way to the cross, all the way until he drew his last breath. Jesus could faintly detect the lovely fragrance of Mary's worship. And your worship is perfume that delights the heart of God too. It's a lovely smell, the Bible says, that that stays, it lingers in his nostrils when he flashes across your mind. You ever have a moment where just in the middle of an ordinary day, you think about Jesus and your heart, something just leaps and you overwhelm with a little burst of gratitude. That's worship that, that delights his heart. When you're riding in the car and you crank the worship music and you're singing your lungs out, that's worship that delights his heart. When you hear that new worship song and you just keep putting on repeat over and over and over again until it just moves you to tears, that's worship that delights his heart. 
when you're worshiping in church and your heart is so full that you just wish that you had the feet of a dancer and you could just take off in the aisle and express what was in your heart at the moment. That, that's worship. That's your perfume. How can we pour out our love for Jesus like Mary? By offering him the perfume of our sexual purity. In the Western world, it's hard for us to really grasp the shock value of what Mary did next. She let down her hair in public and she started to dry Jesus' feet with her hair. In Jesus' day and still in many places in the world today, women never let down their hair in public. Their hair is uh, for their husbands to admire alone. The shock value of a woman letting down her hair in a setting like that would be like somebody taking off their clothes to their underwear here in the sanctuary. Actually, that happened once. We won't go there. <laughs> and what is more, it did? And what is more prized to a woman than her hair? Mary took, listen, Mary took a part of her body that was highly prized and deeply private, and she offered it to Jesus. And we can offer Jesus the parts of our body too. And the way that we offer them to Jesus is by not offering them improperly to anyone else. Paul said, in light of all Christ has done for us, this is our reasonable act of worship, that we offer our bodies to Christ in purity as living sacrifices. Our reasonable act of worship is that we keep our bodies sexually pure. And it's perfume. Your perfume is abstinence from sex outside of the beautiful covenant of marriage. Abstinence in your college years is perfume you can't get back. Abstinence in your young adult years is perfume you can't get back. Absence in your single adulthood is perfume. And once the strength is gone from your body, it's perfume you can't get back again. Your perfume is honoring your marriage vow and not cheating on your spouse, either through imagination or in fact. How do we pour out our love for Jesus? By offering him the perfume of our witness, even when it's risky. I would submit to you that Lazarus was also wasted. Having been raised from the dead, Lazarus was now the star witness to Jesus' ministry. When people heard about the raising of Lazarus, they flocked from Jerusalem to the nearby suburb of Bethany to see Jesus and Lazarus. This miracle catapulted Jesus to the zenith of his popularity. It was common knowledge that the Jewish leaders had it in for Jesus. Now they had it in for Lazarus too. So this dinner in Jesus' honor it was an extremely risky affair. The, the chief priests and elders wanted to kill Jesus, and it was unwise to attract this kind of attention. Lazarus had only recently come back from four days in the grave. I'm sure he didn't want to go back there too soon. Martha served, Mary offered perfume, but what did Lazarus do? He was with Jesus. He associated with Jesus in spite of the risks. He, he testified about what Jesus had done for him in spite of the risks. And your risky witness for Jesus is perfume too. Your admission that, yes, I am one of those born-agains. Your subtle conversations about how Christ has changed your life, the, the extra pressure that they put on you, maybe at work, because you've let it be known that you're a Christian, the teasing that you take, the opportunities you've been denied, the threats from HR, that's perfume that you can't get back. How can we pour out our love for Jesus like Mary? By offering him the perfume of our financial assets. Mary's offering was not only symbolically significant, it was an extravagant financial gift. In Jesus' day, personal wealth was held in hard assets, held in commodities, gold, silver, jewels, rare perfume. Salt was a valuable commodity. Do you know that the word salary means salt money? Livestock, produce, these were all forms of assets. The, the perfume that Mary poured on Jesus was worth about 300 denarii, 300 silver coins. That was the annual salary of a Roman soldier. It was also the annual salary of a laborer. In today's economy, maybe we could call it worth about $40,000. It's likely that this asset was Mary's dowry to secure a marriage. So this perfume represented her future. 
It represented her financial security. It represented her opportunity to marry well. It, it represented her future net worth. It, and she lavished it all on the body of Christ. She was saving it for one purpose, but Jesus said God entrusted it to her for another purpose. Your giving to the body of Christ is perfume too. Your giving represents time you can't get back. 40 or 50 or 60 hours a week that you work. It represents your perspiration, your stress, your weariness. Your giving represents your net worth, your future financial security. It, it, once it's given, you can't get it back. It represents the dream that you have for adding on to the house or renovating the kitchen or the bathroom or adding that new deck. It represents the college fund for your kids or money for your daughter's wedding or, or helping your kids get a start in life. It represents your retirement. Can I tell you that your giving to phase two represents an over and above sacrifice to build something here in Greenwich, Connecticut that is worthy of Jesus. When King David found the farm where the temple was to be built, the owner, a man named Aruna, offered to give it to David for free. And David said, no, 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 no. He refused. He said, I refuse to offer something to the Lord that didn't cost me something. Harvest time, can I tell you that phase two is our perfume. Phase two represents sacrifices that have cost us something. Phase two represents the biggest, best quality, most beautiful sanctuary that we are capable of building all in honor of Jesus. How can we pour out our love for Jesus like Mary? By offering to Jesus the perfume of our everything without reservation. Mary brought a bottle of 40 thousand dollar highly potent perfume and she wasted the whole thing on Jesus when just a little bit would have been enough just a little bit would have been a nice gesture it was so potent that the whole thing wasn't necessary indeed it was too much do you ever try to eat a meal while the sickening sweet smell is in your nose and your mouth you can't even enjoy your food it was it was overkill Mary could have poured just a little bit and kept the rest of her dowry, but she gave everything without holding anything back. She gave everything without reserve because she saw in Jesus someone who was worthy of that extravagant level of sacrifice. And may that be our story too, that, that we offered ourselves to Jesus without holding anything back. All our love, all of our devotion, all of our loyalty, all of our obedience, all of our worship, all of our days dedicated to him, all of our dreams surrendered to him, all of our plans submitted to him, all of our hopes in him, all of our work as unto him, all of our finances regarded as coming from him and belonging to him, all of our mind and body kept pure in honor of him, all of our perfume because we see in Jesus a savior who is worthy of such extravagant worship. Listen to this. John Piper wrote, When the worth of Jesus and the love of his followers match, it's a beautiful thing. Mary was one of the few disciples that followed Jesus all the way to the cross. And standing there at the foot of the cross, her hair and her clothes and her hands smelled like perfume too. So listen to this. The smell that was on Jesus on the cross was on Mary at the foot of the cross. When the worth of Jesus and the love of his followers match, it's a beautiful thing. But you know, just as with Mary, not everyone in our orbit will appreciate it. People who are wasted are uninhibited they're unrestrained and people who are not wasted are disgusted by the behavior of people who are Mary was wasted Martha was wasted Lazarus was wasted just about everybody in the room was wasted but Judas was not wasted 
And because he was not wasted, he was disgusted. Judas was a follower who wasn't in love with Jesus. He he had spent three years in close proximity to Jesus, but he didn't savor the delight of being in Jesus' presence. He had listened to Jesus' words through the filter of his own appetites and his own ambitions. He didn't see the beauty of Jesus nor the value of Jesus' mission to save people from their sins through death on a cross. Judas was disgusted by Mary's display of adoration. He was disgusted by her devotion, by her passion, by her impropriety, by her excessive financial sacrifice. And over in the corner, he sneered, what a waste. Funny thing. Everybody listen to me. The greatest resistance you will ever have in following Jesus is from those who say they are followers but don't really love him. That's good preaching right there. They'll sneer at the perfume of your time that you've offered to Jesus. They'll sneer at the perfume of your sexual purity. They'll sneer at your risky witness. Why can't you just keep quiet? Why can't you just keep your faith to yourself? They'll they'll sneer at the perfume of your sacrificial giving. They'll say, what a waste. Just a little bit would be enough. See, when you don't love Jesus, 30 minutes a week in church is enough. When you don't love Jesus, 10 bucks, 20 bucks in the offering plate, it's, it's plenty enough. Followers who don't really love Jesus will sneer at your passionate worship. If you really want to do something noble, be socially active, help the poor. The truth is, listen, their ethically impressive words are just a cover up for their own inner depravity. That's good right there. Mary's extravagant devotion drew out what was really inside the heart of Judas, and our worship will too. Mary's lavish gift was the final straw that pushed Judas to go betray Jesus for 600, or for 30 pieces of silver. He, he left the dinner at Bethany, and he walked to Jerusalem in the dark, and he arranged the deal. Coincidentally, 30 pieces of silver was the price set by Moses for the value of a slave. In today's economy, worth about $600. See, followers who don't really value Jesus will trade him easily for things of little value. Everybody look at me. Look at me and we're done. We're done. Worship team, you better come help me. Here's the irony. I want you to look at me. Here's the irony. In the end, everyone's perfume gets wasted. In the end, everyone's days and hours and minutes expire. In the end, everyone's strength and vitality diminishes and we're left only with memories either of honor or dishonor depending on how we've lived. In the end, everyone spends their money on something and whatever is left over, we can't take with us. And I hate to tell you, but your ungrateful kids are probably going to blow their inheritance in less than a year, statistics say. In the end, each one of us will stand before the Lord And only those things that we did as unto the Lord will retain any value for eternity. Only those things we did out of love and devotion for Christ will last. Only those things that we did out of loyalty and obedience to Him. Only those things that we did in service to His body on earth and in service to others in His name. Only those things will be less. Everything else will be wasted. In the 1950s, a missionary to Ecuador, Nate Saint, was martyred for Christ. He was 32 years old. Nate Saint was a brilliant university student, and people were surprised and disappointed when they found out that he wanted to become a missionary. Before he died, he wrote this. People ask us why in the world we waste our lives as missionaries. They forget that they, too, are expending their lives. And when the bubble has burst, they will have nothing to show for the years that they wasted. His fellow missionary and martyr, you might know his name, Jim Elliott, wrote this. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep in order to gain that which he cannot lose. 
Judas saw in Jesus nothing of real value, so he traded Jesus for $600. But Mary saw in Jesus the most beautiful thing she had ever seen. And she lavished on him a gift of perfume worth $40,000 that delighted his heart all the way to the cross. When the worth of Jesus and the love of his followers match, it's a beautiful thing. My prayer for you this Lenten season is that you too will become wasted like Mary. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place this morning.